Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with me. Uh, my name is Robert Barron. I'm from IBM. I work in the, with site reliability engineering, helping my clients adopt site reliability engineering and AI ops themselves. I'm very fortunate that one of my hobbies, the history of space exploration, can be related very well to my work, which is reliability, DevOps, operations, and so on. So I've spoken about the subject a number of times here in uh, DevOps days two years ago, SRECon, all day DevOps. I have a blog uh, covering many of these uh, details. But today I wanted to talk to you about the International Space Station as a metaphor for developing with microservices and the reliability. So why do we need a space station in the first place? We've been sending people into space since the 60s, very successful, going landing on the moon, the space shuttle, recently SpaceX and Blue Horizons. So why do we need a space station? Because a space station is very different from a space flight. A space flight goes, comes back, finishes, does one thing. A space station is working in space, producing something, doing scientific experiments over time, testing manufacturing capabilities, building our world for the future. You can, to a certain extent, make a parallel that spaceflight is developing a product. It's a CI launch, is a CI CD pipeline. The space station is running in production itself. And if we look at it, a, a spacecraft is very temporarily in space. It's a one-time thing. You have a mission, you try to succeed. If you fail, you have another mission. Just like if you don't manage to deploy, you have a problem in deployment, you try again. The space station is permanently in space, running in production, just like the systems uh, that we have. Another way of looking at it is that the spacecraft is stateless. It has a, it has a job to do, it does it, and then it's finished. Whereas a space station is something that is very data heavy. If you have uh, a failure, you have to try to reach out, you have to fix the data, you have to um, go on to the next step. So it's not that one day we came and said, we need a space station, this is how we make space stations. Just like in development, there are generations of space stations, starting in the 70s, where we just said, okay, we're gonna take a big spacecraft, launch it into space, and stay there a long time. This was a monolith. We launched the entire station at once. Some of these were small. Some of these, like an American Skylab, were enormous monoliths. In the early 80s, we started to be a bit more advanced with this. We were still sending up one large component, but we started to adapt it, adding sidecars, adding more capabilities. We've developed a new space telescope that we want. We can add it on to the space station later. But the latest space stations, and when I say latest, I mean planned from the 1980s, because it takes time to do these things, are modular. You construct it in stages, each stage goes up and does a specific thing. You can replace your modules, you can move them from, from location to location on the space station, depending on the requirements that you have. Now, if this sounds a little bit like microservices, that's because that's exactly what I wanted to sound like. And if we look at the monolith, and you can see here, Skylab was launched as one giant thing, and you can see the astronauts running inside the space station. It's so large. On the other hand, the International Space Station, while it's the size of a football field, and I have here a model of the station itself, you can see that even though it's the size of a football field, inside these are all small components. There's absolutely no room for a human to run around in here and do the exercise that the Skylab people were doing. And here's a picture of people in different modules in the International Space Station. And again, you can see how compressed this is. There's only place for them to live and the equipment that they have to do their work. There's no spare place. Again, just like containers, microservices, functions as a service, it only does what we want it to do. And there's no spares because of the deployment process, which would be the equivalent of having a VM running one process, but we're wasting all the other capacity and capability of the VM. So Skylab was very wasteful. The International Space Station, very data heavy and compressed. But this comes with difficulties. 
Skylab, the first space stations were launched once, and once you launched it, you immediately had the capability to start working with it. The International Space Station constructed over a period of years. And again, just like this Lego model, each piece has, has a purpose, each piece has a capability. I can disconnect them, I can add them in, in different places, I can do different things. I'm not going to experiment too much here on stage, because it's just going to break, and that will be make me and my kids very sad. But you get the idea. So we have benefits from the, com benefits from the storage, the way we work on the space station, but we have a lot of added complexity. And here we have a diagram of how the International Space Station looked in July of 2021. This is already out of date, just like any configuration database we have, any topology map that we might have is going to be almost immediately out of date because already the Russians have removed one of their components, they've added another component, they're sending up another component uh, by the end of the year. I'm very sorry to say that my International Space Station LEGO model is no longer up to date and it's very difficult to keep it up to date because I have to know exactly what pieces I want to buy and what I want to do. This is something that for us in the development world is much easier because it's all logic. It's just adding another item to a graph database, adding another uh, article to JSON, another line in a CSV file, whatever way we want to keep track of the topology of our configuration. Now, when they first developed the International Space Station, when they designed it in the 80s and 90s, they thought that each module would have a specific role, and there'd be a module for habitation, a place for the astronauts to live. But over time, when they launched the space station. They didn't start off with this model. There was no hotel area for the astronauts. And then they realized after a few years, wait a minute, the astronauts can just sleep wherever. They're floating in space. We just have to tie, the, tie them to the side of the, of the model, and that's where they'll be. And we can save the expense of developing a dedicated habitation module. And again, this is a metaphor for, the, for two things. The one that we can change our designs midstream as we learn from the way that we work and the requirements of our, of our solution, do we actually need all the over-engineered design we had uh, in front or can we take shortcuts that we've already seen how the system works in production so we have our shortcuts. The other thing that we learn from here is that sometimes we have common services. The most common common services that I work with are all the operational ones, the ones that give us observability, logging, monitoring, metrics, traces. They're not something that you can say, okay, this part of the space station is responsible for, for logging. No, it has to be distributed across the entire environment, even though we do have the concept that each module is dedicated to one particular thing. So let's give some resiliency use cases. Most important thing uh, in space is staying alive. And breathing is the first thing that we, we need here. So there are a lot of ways of generating oxygen in the space station in case there's a failure somewhere. The original way they uh, generated oxygen was with a system called Electron, designed by the Russians in the 1980s. It's still running today, but using manufacturing and design ideas from the 1980s, converts water into oxygen, but it has a lot of byproducts things that need to be cleaned out of the system. Not necessarily poisons, but things that require a lot of maintenance. Metaphor for us, technical debt. The way that we have something that does the work, but we need to clean up the log files. We need to re-index it every weekend. We need to uh, resize it after specific times, whatever we need to do. So in 2006, the US sends up the oxygen generation system, works basically the same way as Electron, but with an improved design, less byproducts, which are easier to maintain. That's reducing our technical debt. That's making life easier for us. 2018, the European Space Agency sends up a third way of generating oxygen, which actually works in a completely different way and does not, require, uh, does not create the byproducts or require the water that the other two systems used. So this is not just reducing our technical debt, it's actually eliminating it completely by making sure that the po we're not solving the problem faster, we're making sure it doesn't happen in the first place. Added to that, the byproduct of this system, the output of this system is the input 
for the other two systems, which means that we no longer have to schlep water up into space just to convert it into oxygen. Now, the thing is that these systems can still fail. We have three redundant systems, but note that one of them is from the 1980s, one of them is from 15 years ago, and only one is from a few years, is, is recent, and it doesn't have the capability to support the entire International Space Station. Now, you'd think that the International Space Station needs a, a high level of a re reliability for air. But when you think about it, you can hold your breath. You can hold your breath for one, two, three minutes. Don't forget there's also the air in the space station itself. So the space station actually only needs something like three nines of reliability of air. After that, we have backup systems. For example, candles that we, special candles that we burn that generate oxygen, bottled oxygen in the spacecraft, just you know, scuba oxygen that we open and let the air out. That gives us the breath of air we need in order to solve the problems with the, with the ge oxygen gener generation systems. And even if we don't have that, they can always get into the spacecraft and land on Earth. So while we think about, yes, we need the three oxygen generation systems to be running 24-7, we don't actually. We can allow them to have redundancy. We can allow them to have uh, other ways of working. And then we can lower each component's uh, availability to something like three nines, which is much easier to achieve. Of course, we have to remember the technical debt um, is something th th that will always cause us problems. Another problem which uh, they had recently were spacesuits. Each spacesuit that you wear is actually built up of two or three different pieces in different sizes. So the idea here is that we don't have to manufacture a spacesuit for every astronaut. We can mix and match pieces of spacesuits, and the International Space Station has got pieces for like four or five different uh, spacesuits at the same time. Again, this is the idea that we have our manifest, the sizes of the components that we're running on. We're right-sizing depending on what our requirements are. But the problem is that in 2019, they wanted to have two women, both of whom were size small, having the space walk at the same time. And they realized that they would then need duplicates of components that they did not have. They, did, they had pieces for any variation of of uh, astronauts, except for two, the exact sizes of these two uh, female astronauts. So they had to have a special payload to send in uh, the missing piece of the second spacesuit so they could get dressed and have the very first spacewalk with, with two women. So again, you have flexibility, but you always have to be ready to know what happens if I don't have the flexibility that I thought I had. Where do I get my extra layer of uh, extra layer of redundancy. Maybe I'll just postpone what I want to do so I can get the extra supplies I need. Maybe I'll use a different astronaut to do the spacewalk. So in this case, they had to balance when they wanted to do the spacewalk with which of the astronauts were trained to do the specific uh, spacewalk. Now, astronauts have something in common with DevOps engineers and site reliability engineers. They're supermen who can do everything. However, they still need help sometimes. And in this case, they uh, the European Space Agency developed a solution called Simon, which is an AI-powered little drone there that can float up and follow the astronaut as the astronaut works. And whenever the astronaut has a problem or a question, Simon can answer the astronaut, either verbally or displaying the schematic or the diagram or the piece that the astronaut needs. Simon also knows where the astronaut is facing. So it will always come and look at the astronaut so that he doesn't have to move and context switch from what the astronaut is doing to get the answer that, that he requires. Simon is even responsible for the well-being of the astronaut. He can give him music which suits the type of work that the astronaut wants to do at the moment. So again, an AI assistance in every sense of the word. A couple of do's and don'ts that have been learned over the years from the, from the space station. Space station, as I said, is d composed of a lot of different pieces which have to fit together. Each of them was designed by a different organization in a different country at a different time. Some of these were designed in the 80s. Some of these were designed in the 2010s. How do they fit together? So when I built this with Lego, 
that was very easy. There's one standard, the LEGO way of doing it. But with the International Space Station, they have things called standard payload racks, which means that every piece of equipment or experiment that we want to do has to fit into this rack on the Earth. Then we just make sure it fits into it the right way, and we can launch it up, and we can be sure that it'll fit into the right place on the International Space Station when we get up into space. And they have had decades of experience with different experiments, different payload packages, different components that have to fit in. And again, if you want to look at this as a container, as a pod, as a Kubernetes cluster, that's exactly how I want you to look at it. The connections, you have connections between the American modules and the American modules. You have connections between the Russian modules and the Russian modules. American space uh, modules and spacecraft. And so, so what happens when you have four different standards of connections between components? What's the very next step? A fifth standard to unite them. And that's how all the new components that are going up into the, into the International Space Station or the new spacecraft such as the Dragon or the, or the Starliner will be using the International Docking System Standard. However, the oldest systems such as the, the Russian Soyuz will still be using the old standard of connection between the spacecraft and the space station just because we're not going to reinvent something that already works. So even though we have five standards, a fifth better standard, unified standard, we still are working with the old standards too. Now, a couple of political issues that seem to be special to the International Space Station, but if you look at your organizations, you'll probably see the same things too. The International Space Station was proposed in 69, announced in 84, and canceled in 93 by the US Congress. But again in 93, it was re-announced as the International Space Station, not because anything scientific or engineering or technical had changed, but politics came into the system, into the picture. Now we can use the International Space Station of, as a way of working between countries. And that is actually the major goal of the International Space Station today, is cooperation between multiple organizations. Another recent problem, in August of 2018, a leak was detected in the International Space Station. Air is going out. So we don't need to panic because we've already discussed all the re resilience and reliability solutions we have for a leak, but they investigated it and discovered that there was a small hole in one of the modules that had recently been launched. Now, the first idea when you have a hole in space is that it's a meteor or something from the outside hitting the spacecraft and causing the damage. A little investigation, a little post-mortem, post-incident analysis, and they discovered that it had actually been drilled from the inside of the spacecraft out. And then the big questions come. Who did it? Why did they do it? When did they do it? And if you think that there's going to be a blameless post-mortem, then you're completely wrong. No details have been revealed as to who did it, why did it. There's a lot of... Um, mudslinging going around, which I'm not going to repeat, but the concept here is this is very much a do not do from the International Space Station. We want our blameless post-mortems. We, um, we don't want uh, to find uh, political people to kick and to, and to push out. Now, the lessons learned, or rather the things we have in common with astronauts, because none of us is actually going to be building a space station, but we are going to be building um, production systems. So monoliths are simpler, but they are wasteful in the long term. Again, yeah, I, I'm not telling you something you don't know, but do consider that sometimes if you're doing just a, a proof of concept, an MVP, it might be simpler to just develop something big and dirty and then worry about uh, turning into a microservice in the future. Technical debt, debt is crippling, and yes, you're all falling off your seats because I've told you something you don't know, but take into account the success of the International Space Station where they have technical debt that they cannot avoid. We're doing everything in development, so let's take some responsibility for ourselves and make sure that we're also trying to limit the technical debt uh, that we have. Um, procedures matter. Uh, resources management. Yes, we're doing our resource management, but we have to be sure that we know how to solve problems that we don't predict. Uh, technology is cool, but the business, the politics behind the business is what, is what really drives uh, things forward. 
uh, deployment may get you going, but I think I've shown you a bit about how operations keeps you alive. Um, if you've got, if you're interested further reading, there's the blog that I have more lessons from, lessons from the lunar landings, shuttles to site reliability engineering. NASA has a database of significant interest. Uh, every one of these could be a movie. And IBM's principles of modern cloud service management operations is how I transform this into reality for my clients. So I'm 30 seconds uh, overdue, but thank you very much. And I'm here for the rest of the day.